Here's a question. A person performing a total orthoplasty on a 60-year-old female chooses not to resurface the patella, but instead performs a, 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 a patelloplasty. What's the consequence of not resurfacing the kneecap? And the answer here is there's no difference in relative risk of anterior knee pain. But what is, is important is there is a difference in the revision rate. There's a higher incidence of revision for patients who have an unresurfaced patella as compared to patients who have, an, who have a resurfaced patella. That's important to know. What is important to know also is that the total knee arthroplasty uh, in terms of function, there is no difference. And outcome data suggests no difference. Moving on to approaches. Obviously, surgical approaches is dictated by surgeon preference, prior incisions, degree of deformity, and patient's body habitus. When there are multiple incisions about the knee, you definitely want to choose the more medial incision because the blood supply, I'm sorry, choose the more lateral incision because the blood supply comes from the medial side. That's important. Choosing the wrong incision can cause skin loss necessitating a flap. When crossing transverse incisions, you'd like to make them at 90 degrees. And at minimum, you want a 60 degree angle so that the apex of that, of that incision does not die. So we're going to move ahead and talk about various approaches, the median parapetellar, the mid-vastus, the subvastus for complex primary and revision total neuroarthroplasty. We'll discuss the medium parapetellar again, the quadriceps snip, the VY term down, as well as the tibial tubercle osteotomy. We'll talking about the medium parapetellar approach, clearly it's the most common approach utilized in total knee arthroplasty. The advantages of this approach is clearly it's extensile in nature. It can be extended proximally and distally. The disadvantage. That, or the question that can be asked during the examination is, in performing a lateral release, what is the consequence of performing a lateral release in a patient who's had a medium parapetal approach? And that would be a vascular necrosis of the patella. A lateral parapetal approach, it can also be utilized much less frequently, more commonly used for the unicarpal knee replacement. It can be done for the valgus knee. Some of the disadvantages of the lateral approach are clearly the mobilization of the patella is much more difficult. You can get patellar tendon avulsion and may require even a more extensile tibial tubercle osteotomy. Here's a question. Which of the following surgical approaches to the knee has the greatest potential for denervation of the quad muscle? Looking at this question, it's pretty self-explanatory. Only one of the answers actually violates the, quad, the, the quadriceps mechanism, and that's the mid-vastus. And of course, that's the answer. Several studies have shown that the mid-vastus approach can result in a denervation of the VMO. Its long-term consequence is debatable, but that has definitely been shown via EMG. The mid-vastus, again, is an, is an approach that's utilized in an attempt to preserve the quadriceps mechanism. It has been shown to have a slightly increased recovery rate of the quad function. It also has been shown to have an improvement in patella tracking. Uh, but in terms of long-term follow-up or long-term outcomes, there seems to be no advantage to the mid-vastus as it compares to the bare patella approach. Some relative contraindications that should be mentioned. If someone has a stiff knee, has less than 80 degrees of flexion, I would say less than 90 degrees of flexion, then the mid-vastus approach will put tremendous amount of stress across the patellar tendon, making exposure much more difficult. The obese patient inherently is more difficult in exposure. Adding the mid-vastus can facilitate or can, it can, it can uh, uh, create a, a complication to the patellar tendon itself. <coughs> Subvastus approach 
is a popularized approach that's utilized in an attempt, again, to avoid the quadriceps mechanism. It has similar advantages to that of the mid-vast approach in that the patella is not violated, the quadriceps mechanism is not violated, and the quad tendon is not violated. Relative contraindications here, again, are potentially the patient's uh, habitus, obese patients, it may be difficult already. Uh, it's, a, it's the least extensile exposure. It's sometimes very difficult in people who have a large quadriceps mechanism for eversion or lateralization of the patella. MIS. So MIS, an article from, by Peter Benuti, looks at the effect of uh, MIS surgery on recovery, and his data suggests that MIS surgery has led to more rapid recovery as compared to conventional approaches. The definition of MIS surgery is incision length. It's, it is debatable. Some people have said to be smaller than 12 centimeters or 10 centimeters. Here's the question. During the course of revision to only orthoplasty being a medium parapetal approach, a surgeon does a complete intraarticular release, synovectomy, but exposure is still inadequate. He then performs a quadriceps snip. The knee is stable. What can the patient expect in terms of physical therapy following the surgical intervention? So here the question is really asking us, the only, only change other than what we've already discussed is the addition of the quadriceps snip, and does the quadriceps snip have any negative effect on the patient's function post-surgery, and should there be any limitation in their physical therapy? And the answer is no. There should be no restriction in range of motion or weight-bearing after surgery. There's been good evidence to suggest that a quadriceps snip, if repaired, the patient can be rehabbed normally with, without the development of an extensor lag, and no change in pain protocol. The quad snip, as we just mentioned, begins at the apex of the parapetellar approach or at the quad tendon and then extends 45 degrees angled toward the vastus lateralis. Again, we have to emphasize that with the quadriceps snip, you can facilitate lateralization of the patella and there's really no change in the postoperative protocol as it pertains to physical therapy and rehabilitation. The tibial tubercle osteotomy, this is another excellent exposure opportunity to, for removal of components. The key here is the length of the bony fragment. You want it to be 6 to 10 centimeters in length to avoid fracture. It is an excellent approach if done well and it will and without a significant um, uh, negative consequence to the patient's uh, rehabilitation. Uh, you don't have the same extensor lag that like you can have with a VY turndown. The, the disadvantages are obviously tibial nonunion or potential fracture of the tibial tubercle as it becomes elevated. The VY turndown is really for that arthrofibrotic knee. It's the medium parapetal approach. And then the uh, incision or the quadriceps is then cut, as you see depicted in the, in the picture, back toward the lateral side. It allows excellent exposure. A question that you could potentially see is obviously the lag is a consequence of the VY turndown or lengthening of the quadriceps mechanism. Its utilitarian approach is, is really be, is, uh, beneficial in patients who do have arthrofibrosis and you would purposefully want to increase the length of the quadriceps mechanism. Uh, another question that you could see as it returns to the VY turndown is that its effects on the patella. If it's in conjunction with a lateral release, clearly the entire blood supply to the patella will be compromised and thus could lead to patellar AVN. <clears throat> Bilateral total arthroplasty. This is one slide that talks about its efficacy. Its definition is simultaneous, sequential, or staged. Simultaneous is two surgeons performing the bilateral knees at the same time. Sequential is one surgeon with one anesthetic, and stage is obviously with a few days in between each total orthoplasty. A question that you could see, the date that you see here, old literature that's been depicted in the, in the, uh, on the purple,
but in actuality, new literature has looked at simultaneous compared to sequential and staged. A paper out of, from Dunbar out of Acta Orthopedics says that when you look at simultaneous as compared to sequential, simultaneous has a statistically significant increase of inpatient mortality as compared to sequential or staged. When comparing sequential to staged, their inpatient mortality risk is roughly the same. The revision rate following, this, following each procedure stage is slightly lower than that of sequential. Here's a question. The use of vancomycin impregnated bone cement during total arthroplasty is most strongly recommended for which of the following patients? And if you read the question, there's only one patient who can justify the use of vancomycin in the bone cement, and that's the 68-year-old male undergoing a second stage revision arthroplasty for deep infection. The use of antibiotics in bone cement remains controversial, particularly in the primary total knee arthroplasty. There is some data that suggests that in the higher risk patient, there may be some efficacy. I doubt it that you'll see a question on this issue. What you may see is, the, is that what is the consequence of adding antibiotics to the strength of cement? It, without question, reduces the strength approximately 4% and can increase the risk of aseptic loosening. It has been shown to reduce the incidence of deep infection in the revision arthroplasty, and therefore it is indicated in the revision to only arthroplasty. If you enjoyed this video, please consider leaving a like. We'd love to hear your thoughts and what you'd like to see next in the comments. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and follow us on social media.